Okay, uh, so uh, today we're going to talk about uh, the Pixel Machine. Uh, this is a device from AT&T, came out in 1987. And uh, the Pixel Machine is a group of parallel processors that are arranged in uh, different groups of nodes and there is a pixel pipeline that is either 18 or 16 serial nodes that uh, daisy chain feed into each other. There are between 16 and 64 parallel pixel nodes and the pixel nodes have a local processor but they also have a chunk of frame buffer associated with them. And at the uh, back end there is a uh, video scan out process that they call the pixel funnel. Each node has an AT&T DSP32C. This is a digital signal processor. It's a um, Harvard architecture machine. If you're um, not familiar with digital signal processors, they're very common in uh, the 80s, used for processing audio signals and doing other uh, highly floating point intensive operations. They have typically the ability to do a floating point multiply accumulate in a single cycle. So that means you can take two floating point numbers, multiply them together, add a third floating point number onto that uh, product. And this is the basis of a lot of uh, digital signal processing algorithms for audio processing, audio filtering, um, things of that nature. It's also a core operation in 3D computer graphics because when you are orienting 3D objects in three-dimensional space and then projecting them onto a two-dimensional screen. There's a lot of multiply accumulate operations as you use matrices to represent the orientation of objects in space and then you have three-dimensional coordinates. You multiply the three-dimensional coordinate through a four by four matrix to do scale, rotate, translate, and projection onto the screen. So this fast multiply accumulate operation is important for graphics as well as audio processing. Um, the machine itself has a VME bus uh, host interface. It connects to a sun, typically, uh, through VME bus. So this is a machine that's uh, about the size of this little pedestal that's holding the projector here. It has a bunch of cards that plug into it and then that whole thing is connected to a host computer through a VME bus uh, adapter card. They had a 3D library, uh, or they had several different APIs for doing various uh, kinds of tasks with uh, uh, the machine, and Piclib is their 3D API, Raylib is their ray tracing API, and they also had DevTools, which is the compiler that runs on a Sun workstation that cross compiles the code into the machine language of the AT&T DSP32C. And you would download the code into the Pixel machine from the Sun host. And then it would execute in the Pixel machine being fed data from the Sun host, turning that into pictures, which are then video scanned out onto a monitor attached to the Pixel machine. Um, so this is kind of a figure, you know, block diagram of the, the overall architecture. You've got a parallel interface to the host. You've got a uh, network of uh, processors that act as a transformation pipeline. You've got the pixel nodes and then the pixel funnel does the video scan out at the end. Now, if you've ever programmed a modern GPU, you'll see some things that are very similar here. You've got a network of processors that are doing per vertex computation. That's the transformation pipeline. So here you're doing things like maybe you're computing shading quantities per vertex. You're transforming vertices from model space into device coordinate space. And then the primitives that are having been transformed, well then you'll scan them out in to generate a stream of pixels associated with the primitives and those that videos uh, sorry that rasterization process is happening in the pixel nodes that are um, have the distributive frame buffer 
So you can already see a similarity to modern GPUs where you have shader units dedicated to vertex processing and you have shader units dedicated to pixel processing. Uh, what's interesting as well as in a modern GPU, the shader units are typically identical cores. They're just assigned different tasks by how the workload is divided in by the, you know, either by the driver or um, in some cases it's, it's the allocation of processors to vertex shading or processors allocated to pixel shading operations. Sometimes that is a fixed uh, split of workload. Other times the workload is assigned dynamically because if you have a, if you have an application that is very heavily pixel oriented, you don't want to be wasting those GPUs dedicated, dedicating them to vertex processing if you're not doing very much vertex processing and vice versa. You could be vertex processing heavy and light on rasterization. Um, the pixel machine has, um, due to the nature of the distributed frame buffer intimately connected to the pixel processors, the division of labor between how many vertex processors you have and how many pixel processors you have is determined literally by how many cards of each type you have connected into the system. It's a scalable system. You want more power, you plug in more cards. Um, it's a coarse grained pipeline in that, uh, you know, there's each of these processors is just a single CPU. It's, it's a DSP, it's a fast CPU, it's very good at floating point, but it's a coarse grain pipeline and each of the processors are, are uh, running their own, they can be running their own instruction stream or they can be running the same instruction stream all in, in lockstep, it just depends on how you program it. So it could be a multiple instruction, multiple data array is a way of thinking about it. You have a serial portion of the pipeline followed by a parallel portion. And the reason that you want to have the first portion be serial is because if you are drawing primitives, the order in which the primitives are processed matters. So if I draw one triangle first and then I draw a second triangle, I expect the second triangle to appear on top of the first one if they're not doing any kind of hidden surface elimination. I just did the order in which I draw things is the order in which I expect to see them rendered. So that serial portion happens first. Once the primitives have been processed into screen space, the individual pixels that result from those primitives can all be processed in parallel. So there's the parallel section following afterwards. There is no um, hardware rasterizer or specific hardware dedicated to any particular kind of graphic operation in this pipeline. It's all software controlled but you do have those fast DSP processors to implement the core of the graphics algorithms. So you've got fast, fast floating point computation per node. Uh, in your serial pipeline, you can either have nine or 18 nodes, depending on how many boards you put in. And the uh, pixel nodes, you can have 16, 20, 32, 40, or 64. Again, depending on how many boards you plug into the machine. Um, the frame buffer itself is a 32-bit RGBA color channel with a 32-bit floating point Z buffer. And a floating point Z buffer is fairly common now. You could have uh, floating point channels uh, for your Z buffer in a modern GPU, but in, in 87 to have a floating point Z buffer was a bit exotic. Uh, most high-end workstations of the time, say from SGI or um, you know, even DEC and Sun and HP all had their own 3D accelerators at the time. 24-bit integer Z buffer was more typical. You might even see a 16-bit Z buffer, but uh, because the Z values are computed in screen space and you get uh, perspective distortion, you, you kind of, 16-bit isn't quite enough to get good resolution of interpenetrating surfaces. So floating point Z buffer, that's, that's pretty exotic, and 32 bits. So that's 24 bits, IEEE 32-bit float, so it's 24-bit Mantissa, 8-bit sine exponent. Um, the frame buffer has the processors divided in an interleaved fashion, so the um, adjacent memory cells 
uh, it, it, representing the frame buffer memory in a single node are not representing adjacent pixels in screen space. Um, it had uh, 1280 by 1K resolution or 1K by 1K at uh, 60 Hertz. Um, this is high end uh, resolution for the time, but not like super crazy high end, just kind of what you would expect on your typical high end work, uh, workstation. Uh, it can vid do video scan out in NTSC or PAL, depending on how the um, video scan out is configured. And it can do single, double, or quadruple buffering. Um, here's a d picture of the DSP32C die. And uh, it's just kind of interesting that the blocks are very regular. You can see there's a, you know, the register file memory there, and you've got a big unit, a big chunk of the chip area is dedicated to the multiply accumulate, uh, the floating point operations. Um, remember, this is 87, so like typical PC at the time wouldn't have even had a floating point accelerator standard. You would have to get either an 8087 or I'm not sure when the 287 came out, but you would have had to have gotten a, a floating point coprocessor. Even the 68000 did not have floating point operations built into it. You had to get a floating point uh, companion chip. So the DSP32C is arranged as a, uh, you have three blocks of on-chip RAM, and this gives you access to the three operands of a multiply accumulate operation. So that's how they're able to get that happening in one clock cycle. It's a pipeline architecture, but the pipeline is not particularly deep. But uh, with the, uh, the three RAM blocks, you can get the two operands of the multiply and then the third operand of the final add to get that all coming into the uh, floating point unit compute the result and go back out to memory, uh, go, go back out to one of these RAM blocks. Um, there's your typical kind of, you know, uh, flags, registers, and um, you have an integer ALU unit separate from the floating point ALU unit, so you can have integer operations occurring in parallel with the floating point operations. Um, and if you, if you really want to know more about this uh, architecture, the instruction set manuals and stuff are online on BitSavers. Um, roughly this machine, the, the uh, CPU is running at 20 megahertz, giving you five MIPS and 10 megaflops. And that's a lot for 87. And this is per node. So I can have up to 64 nodes all grinding away. Um, you've got 32 point, 32 bit floating point arithmetic. Um, now, when you, if you, you may know that when you do a multiply, the product has to be stored in a register that's larger than the size of the operands, otherwise you lose part of the computation. So internally, there's 40-bit accumulators that participate in the multiply accumulate. Um, you've got 22 16-bit integer registers that can be also used as addresses, uh, so as pointers. Uh, the memory interface externally is 16-bit and there are parallel and serial I.O. ports on this chip with uh, DMA. So using DMA, you can get data into those RAM blocks, have a tight inner loop that is processing on uh, operands from on chip, computing results, and then you could either send it back out through DMA via serial or via parallel or just regular bus access. But with the DMA bringing in the input data, processing a tight inner loop using the on-chip RAM, you can get things uh, going in such a way that you get the maximum throughput through the chip without tying up the CPU to do things like just mundane memory to, you know, off-chip to on-chip memory transfers. Uh, another interesting thing about this chip is that uh, the assembly language doesn't look like your typical assembly language. It looks more like C. It looks like a restricted, simplified form of C. So instead of saying add R2 comma R1 comma R3 to take R1 plus R3 and store the result in R2, you just write R2 equals R1 plus R3. So the assembly syntax is very approachable to anybody that is already familiar with C. Uh, 
Uh, it does have a C compiler and linker, and also they gave uh, part of the DevTools kit was a simulator so that you could run a simulated execution of your code on the host without having to load it into uh, the DSP32C itself. Uh, so here's kind of some examples of what the uh, assembly language looks like. You can see it's uh, the assembly language instructions are on the left. That's not uh, an abstraction. That is what you would write as the assembly. So it's very much like C code. And, um, and it's, you have the standard things going on when you do arith arithmetic operations. The flag register is set to represent that, you know, aspects of the result. Was the result zero? Was the result negative? Uh, did a carry operation result from adding or subtracting? Um, so the pipeline nodes are the, uh, that first part that, where you would think of vertex processing happening. And that's configured as a serial pipeline. There's either one or two boards uh, with either nine or 18 nodes. So it's basically two boards that are identical. And they either, if you have two boards, the first one feeds the second, the second one then feeds into the uh, frame buffer group of nodes. And if you just have one, then you just have one board that's just feeding the frame buffer. So, um, but what's interesting is you can have different code running in different parts of this serial pipeline. And why would you want to do that? So on a, on a modern GPU, typically you write a vertex shader, and that vertex shader is executed in parallel for different vertices, and then the results of that is fed to rasterization. Here, you've got a serial pipeline, and these uh, individual nodes don't have much memory, so if you have a lot of vertex processing to do, you would split that vertex processing into a sequence of stages, and you'd have the different slices of the whole uh, amount of processing you need to do loaded into the different serial nodes. So maybe the, so let's say for example, you're gonna position objects in three space. So you're gonna take three dimensional objects, you're going to project them through some, uh, you know, translate, rotate, scale operations, and then they're gonna be projected into screen space. And you also have, say, five lights. So you've got five different lighting computations you need to do per vertex to identify the amount of shading contributed to each vertex by each light. Well, that's a lot of work to do in just one node. So you might have the first node just do a transformation from model space where your objects live into a, unif a uniform world space. So if I have two cars in the scene, each car is represented only once in model space, and it's drawn twice, but at different locations in world space. So you have your first node transforming from model space into world space, and then your second node is doing the uh, computations for the first light, and then the third node is doing the computation for the second light, and so on. So you're dividing up the work. It's all, it can all be done independently, um, but by staggering it that way, you get higher throughput because each node is doing less work per primitive, per vertex, and you're just daisy chaining them up and you get them uh, stacked up in a pipeline so you get higher throughput overall. Um, that's, that's in contrast to what tip, how it typically a, a modern GPU operates where all the vertex processing is identical and it's happening in parallel across uh, vertices of different primitives. Um, the result of all of that is broadcast uh, to the pixel nodes. Uh, but an interesting feature is, what if you wanted to take the result of that vertex processing and you want to send it back to the host for further processing on the host, or maybe you want to save it out or, or, or what have you, you can, after the serial processing is finished, that can be sent back uh, to the host at high speed through over the VME bus. Uh, other, or it can be uh, broadcast to the uh, parallel pixel nodes. Um, the, uh, when you broadcast to the pixel nodes, uh, you, it is uh, shared in the, the two pipeline configurations. So um, this is basically how the things are connected in each node. There's a, an input FIFO that uh, is feeding data from uh, the previous stage into the DSP processor, and then there's an output FIFO. 
Uh, a FIFO is just basically, it's a first in, first out buffer. So data comes in and uh, data is uh, coming out in the same order that it came in. And it, these FIFOs just basically act as a way to do a little bit of load balancing between the different nodes. Uh, one node may be processing things at a faster rate um, you know, in bursts than the next node can accept. So if the first, if the node supplying the output to the next is doing uh, brief bursts, you don't want to have to slow that node down. You want to kind of balance that out by having the bursts go into this buffer that is going to feed the subsequent pipeline. Uh, and there's also a connection back out to the VME bus from each, from each pipeline node. So you're not limited to reading the results of the pipeline out after wait by having to wait for it to go through the whole serial pipeline. You can read it out at any stage. Uh, the uh, pipeline node has, um, that uses that parallel uh, DMA interface to talk to the VME bus. Um, and the very first FIFO coming in to the first node is fed by the host from the VME bus uh, interface. And the very last FIFO node feeds into the pixel node array. Um, the last pipeline node also has a, um, a, a FIFO to feed the, the VME bus. So I guess, I guess this, this picture here is just talking, is, it was, that VME bus illustration is just for the very last node. Sorry about that. Um, you've got not very much, 9K 32-bit words of SRAM attached to each node, and that is for code and data. So although you have this big, uh, you know, powerful array of stuff, um, you don't have a whole lot of code space or data space per node. So that might be another reason why you would split things uh, into different code chunks executing in multiple nodes, maybe you can't fit it all into a single node. Um, and as I mentioned, the typical workload for a pipeline node is uh, vertex processing, so 3D transforms, clipping, projecting, projection, and per-vertex shading. So per-vertex shading is computing light contributions, basically. It can be other things as well. You may be computing texture coordinates, you may be computing other values that are to be used for shading at the per pixel level. The amount of stuff that you can compute is really only limited by your imagination and the space constraints. A lot of um, graphical effects in a modern GPU, it's coming up with creative ways of computing stuff per vertex and computing stuff per pixel and combining them together to make something that looks cool. Um, the pixel nodes are configured as a two-dimensional array, and each node has a chunk of the frame buffer. They're fed by uh, a single broadcast from the last uh, stage of the serial nodes, so the pipeline nodes. So when data comes out of your serial pipeline, it's not, you, although I think you, there's a way to address a particular GPU or a particular node in the, in the parallel array, it's tip, more typical that it would be broadcast to the entire array. Um, and the final uh, output is either to uh, the frame buffer or again back to the host via the VME bus. So very similar to a pipeline node, a pixel node, it has an input FIFO and um, it has a, it, there's no more processing after this, so it doesn't have an output FIFO. Uh, it has a connection, it can send stuff back to the VME, VME bus. It has a large amount of uh, frame buffer memory, that's the VRAM. So the VRAM is participating in video scan out but it also has a chunk of this uh, DRAM, the 64K 32-bit word DRAM. That is for things like storing textures, storing fonts, any kind of uh, graphic uh, image resources that you need as part of your uh, final shading. And you've again got this 9K by 32-bit word SRAM, that's where your code and core uh, data is going to be executing from. 
The VRAM is the representing the interlaced frame buffer chunk that's associated with each pixel node. And there is a switching fabric that allows adjacent uh, pixel, well, yeah, it's, it's arranged in a, in, a, in a torus interconnect pattern, basically, uh, that the individual pixel nodes can communicate with their neighbors. And this is for things like if you're doing image processing, maybe you're doing edge detection, you need to communicate with adjacent processors to find out what do you have in your frame buffer so that I can match my edge detection up with the pixels adjacent to me. Uh, and so as we said, there's uh, two banks of this uh, 64K 32-bit VRAM that is the interleaved frame buffer. There's the, uh, the DRAM uh, 64K 32-bit words. This is used for the Z buffer. Basically, the Z buffer algorithm here is done in software. That's another difference from um, other GPUs, even of the period. Typically, you would have the Z buffer algorithm implemented as a fixed functional unit that does uh, Z buffer compare. So, if you're not familiar with the Z buffer algorithm, as pixels are rasterized, a depth is computed for each pixel, and the pixel that's closest to the camera is the one that wins. So, you compute the Z value of a new pixel, you compare it to the Z value stored in the frame buffer, whichever is newer determines whether the pixel gets stored or not. So if the pixel is that I've just computed is behind the pixel that's already stored in the frame buffer, then it's obscured by something that's closer to the camera. So that gives you hidden surface uh, uh, elimination is basically what it works out, works out to be. Um, now, because the Z buffer algorithm, algorithm in this machine is all done in software, it's interesting because uh, for opaque surfaces, Z buffer resolution is trivial. You know, whatever is closest wins. But if I have surfaces that are uh, partially transparent, if they're completely transparent, you can't see them, of course, because they're completely transparent. But if it's partially transparent, now the hidden surface elimination gets a little bit harder. The only way to do it completely correct is to take all the Z values of all the pixels that intersect at a certain point in screen space and you have to sort them by depth, and then you have to composite them from back to front in order to get it completely resolved correctly. Uh, this is still a problem in a modern GPU. There's no GPU that, that I'm aware of that has any hardware implementation of uh, a, that sorting algorithm to resolve partially transparent uh, surfaces. So what people usually do, you draw all your opaque surfaces first, and then you draw your transparent surfaces from back to front. So then the order in which they're rasterized is already uh, resolved out the sorting order. And all the, uh, the, the GPU has to do per pixel then is do the, uh, the compositing of these transparent surfaces as you stack them on top of each other. But even that, it's, it's not always possible to take two independent objects and sort them relative to each other because you could have triangles that interpenetrate, or you could have um, objects that they overlap in depth, so they don't necessarily have a clear uh, idea of which primitive is in front of which other primitive. But it, usually these things, the effects are subtle enough that people don't really notice, or you just make your life easier and don't use transparent objects. Um, your pixel data is 16 bits per channel, so not eight bits of red, green, and blue. It's 16 bits of red, green, and blue. So you've got actually a pretty wide dynamic range, especially for 87. And again, 32-bit floating point Z, this is also a wider range than was typical. Um, you've got the, um, although it's 16 bits per channel, the video scan out is only using the low eight bits. But it does mean that you can do interesting things because you could have a 16-bit image in the frame buffer and then you can send that back to the host. So the full 16 bits is available to you, just the video scan out only uses the low eight bits. Um, again, these pixel nodes are arranged in a torus network where each node is connected to its nearest uh, four compass point neighbors. And um, you've got five megabits per second of bandwidth between nodes, 
a typical kind of workflow uh, workload rather that you would have doing in the uh, pixel nodes is uh, you've got any kind of per pixel shading you'd be doing texture lookup uh, texture filtering texture synthesis alpha blending uh, stencil operations accumulation operations and just to briefly explain a little bit about those if you're not familiar uh, per pixel shading would be doing things where so there's a, uh, a lighting algorithm called Garot shading where you compute the light at the vertices the contribution of each light at the vertices and then you just interpolate between vertices this is fine for, for uh, you know, most objects, but it's not the most accurate lighting computation because you didn't compute the light interacting, reflecting off a surface at every pixel. You only computed it at three points on a triangle and then just interpolated in between. So if you want more accurate lighting, you can use a, a lighting algorithm, Fong shading. This is computing the angle of incidence of a light against the surface at every pixel. So you could do that here. Uh, you could do per pixel lighting. Um, and you can even go beyond standard rasterization techniques and you could implement ray tracing. And um, now you've got much more accurate simulation of light, particularly for reflections and uh, shadows. Shadows are hard to do in a rasterization oriented algorithm, but they're trivial to do in a ray tracing algorithm. Um, the other interesting thing here is that because we've got the, all this floating point power residing in these nodes that are operating at the pixel level, maybe we don't use textures as images. Maybe we use textures that are synthesized. So we may be doing Fourier noise or some kind of stochastic modeling, some kind of function that we compute the texture at every pixel instead of looking it up out of a bank of memory. Um, stencil operations, again, you can do that uh, on uh, modern GPUs. They have dedicated hardware to stenciling operations. This is basically, basically do things like cutouts and masking. Here, because everything is under the control of software, we could do that uh, in a software operation on the pixel nodes. Um, so the final part of the machine is you have this frame buffer that's distributed across the pixel nodes. The frame buffer has to be scanned out, the pixels have to be scanned out in order to create the video signal. So there's a uh, chunk of hardware they call the pixel funnel, and this basically reorders the pixels that are read out of the distributed memory so that the pixels are presented to the final video circuitry as um, in order of raster scan. So the, um, there's also a, a 256 by 10 bit color lookup table that is used for gamma adjustment. Now if you, I don't know if you're familiar with gamma, but uh, every monitor and every display device has nonlinear characteristics. So we like to have our images computed as if there's a linear range of intensity levels, brightness levels in the red, green, and blue, but that's not actually how the monitors work. So to compensate for the nonlinearity of the display, there'll be a lookup table at the end that it takes your linear intensities and maps them to the nonlinear intensities of the monitor. And that process is called uh, gamma correction or gamma adjustment. And it turns out that if you're using 8-bit red, green, and blue channels, an 8-bit wide lookup table isn't enough resolution because of the nonlinearity. But a 10-bit lookup table is enough. So they have a 10-bit color lookup table at the end whose only purpose is to compensate for the nonlinearity of the display device. Now, uh, if you're a a gamer on Xbox or any of the consoles or PC, you, it's really easy to tell when the developers got gamma correction wrong because things either look too washed out or too dark. And you end up fiddling with the controls on your monitor or you go to the driver control panel and move the little gamma curve around. And it's amazing to me that this is a problem that's been known since the 1960s that displays are nonlinear and we, it's just, 
so hard to get right. You have to control it at every portion of the art pipeline of the, of the asset creation for your game. And then you have to have the programmers get it right as well. And then you have to make sure when you're exporting images out of Photoshop that it's not gamma correcting them because you're going to do the gamma correction. It, it's just such a pain. It's amazing that we still have a hard time with this problem. Um, but the, if you can throw the right hardware at it, it then becomes easy. Just do everything, all your assets, all your programming is all done linear. You just assume linear intensities and then you program the gamma correction into that color lookup table and then poof, it's done. But you have to keep everything linear before you get there. Um, such a big pain, it's amazing we still have that problem. Um, the video timing coming out of the scan out circuitry has the ability to sync to an external source. And if you're just displaying on a monitor, this doesn't matter so much, but if that monitor is being filmed by a camera, then it matters. If you've ever tried to film a monitor, you see weird, you know, the, looks like the monitor is flashing in and out in, in darkness. And that's because the video generation is not timed to be in sync with the camera. So if you have a sync input to your graphic system, you can synchronize the video scan of the camera with the video scan of, your mon of the signal being generated by your system, and then it all looks, you know, like it should be. Uh, that's also, the video sync is also important in like a, a broadcast television environment. Less so now that everything's digital, but w certainly with analog systems, you need to be able to uh, guarantee that the images that you're generating are in sync with the rest of the TV system. Uh, okay, so let's talk a little bit about the software environment for this thing. You have your application program is running on the host, which is typically like a it, this would have been a, like a Sun 3 workstation. Um, you are doing two things on the host. You're loading the code to be run into the pixel machine, and then you're feeding it data, and you're possibly reading data back. So the um, typical architecture of things is to take the data stream of 3D graphics information coming from the host and organize that into a sequence of messages that you're sending to the first node in that serial uh, pipeline. So this might be things like setting the matrix that defines the transformation between model space and view space, uh, setting light parameters, what color is the light, what's the position of the light, if it's a light that has a direction, what direction is the light pointing it. Uh, graphic input primitives, triangles, points, lines, whatever, you know, maybe you've got uh, in your serial nodes, maybe you've got something that's smart enough to say, I'm just going to receive spheres as a center point and a radius, and then I'm going to turn that into something that the pixel processor can then rasterize directly from a uh, description of a sphere. Then they don't have to take a sphere and turn it into a bag of triangles, and I get some kind of weird uh, you know, polygonalized profile or silhouette of a sphere, I get a sphere that looks perfect because it's defined intrinsically as a sphere. We don't have to worry about the limitations of hardware rasterizers that only accept triangles because there is no hardware rasterizer. Everything's done in software. Um, so the host will transmit these messages to the pixel machine that feeds that very first FIFO going into the serial portion of the pipeline. The download code into the pipeline, into the, the serial nodes and the parallel nodes, and you're not limited to downloading code before you're processing data. You can be processing data and then changing the code on the fly as you're sending it uh, data. There's no, there's no restriction of like, well, you can't load code while you're processing. You, you can be interleaving these operations. Also, there's a, uh, there may be some kind of you know, mouse or something connected to the, the frame buffer. So you can handle information coming back from the pixel machine about the mouse cursor and doing UI operations and things like that. Um, so for the pipeline portion, you're going to be writing algorithms that act serially on the data. Uh, you've got pipelining to reduce the amount of work that each node has to do and your typical workload in these uh, serial pipes, or, sorry, these pipeline serial nodes 
things like geom geometry amplification. A case of a procedural sphere is something that is an example of that. You might have something like um, uh, subdivision surfaces where you've got uh, a description of a surface and you refine it by subdividing the description repeatedly to get um, geometric primitives that represent the true curved surface at a necessary resolution. So if an object is far away, you don't have to tessellate it very much because it's small, it, you can't resolve much detail in it. If the object is close to the camera, you subdivide it a lot to give it a nice smooth appearance. The host just sends down this compact description of saying, here's the parameters that define this surface that will be subdivided by the serial nodes, and then they repeatedly chew on it depending on how much detail the individual object needs, spitting information farther down the pipeline. Uh, you've got, as we talked about earlier, view transformation. Another uh, process that would happen here is object culling. So if I have primitives that are facing away from the camera, and I assume that my, all my objects are closed surfaces, so like a sphere, well, I'm gonna see the front side of the sphere, I'm not gonna see the back side of the sphere. So if I've got primitives representing the back side, I can discard them immediately, and that saves work farther down the pipeline. Again, these are things that a modern GPU does. They do them in fixed functional units. The so-called backface culling is what would happen on a modern GPU. Here, we're doing it all in software. So if we want backface culling, we have to look at the orientation of the faces of a triangle, look at its surface normal, see it's pointing away from the camera. That means there's a backfacing triangle, so we can just discard it and go on to the next one. Uh, you've object shading. This is, if we're doing per vertex lighting computations, we would do that here. Uh, if we're doing clipping, where primitives are restricted to a certain portion of 3D space or they're out, you know, a primitive may lie on the boundary of what the camera can see. So if the part of the primitive is outside the boundary of what the camera is looking at, we need to clip that primitive so it's within the bounds of the camera to generate a new primitive that's clipped to fit within what the camera can see. Uh, viewport mapping is the process of taking our three-dimensional primitives and figuring out where they're going to end up on the screen. It may, we may not be using the whole screen. We may be have taken the screen and subdivided into a series of smaller regions. Each one is a viewport, and we may need to therefore clip primitives not just against the camera, but also against a particular portion of the screen. Um, each node can work on a message that it received from upstream, and it can forward that message on or not. So maybe if we are doing uh, lighting, and we've got multiple lights, and each node in the pipeline stages are doing computation for one light, they do their part and then they forward the message on to get the rest of the lighting done. If, there, if this message has to do with uh, something that is entirely handled by this node, you just consume the message and don't forward it on. Uh, you can also have new messages generated for downstream nodes by a node in the middle. So it's not necessary that a message originate at the host. It can originate from inside the pipeline as well. Um, you, over time and depending on the workload that you're sending it, the, the balance of what these individual nodes are doing can change. And obviously to get the highest performance out of the system, you want to measure that and try to find out what's the optimum uh, balance of processing between the nodes for the workloads that you're sending into the machine. For the pixel nodes, you've got a uh, this is where all your parallel algorithms are going to be occurring, uh, your raster scan conversion, any image compositing. This is also typically the place where you're, if you were doing a ray tracing oriented style renderer, this is where that would happen. Um, typical things that you would do in these kinds of nodes, you do anti-aliased filtered depth cued vectors, and this is how you get uh, what looks like a vector display on a raster machine, if you do the necessary filtering and draw them correctly, it can be just as crisp as a vector display. It takes some work, it takes some effort, and you gotta do some careful calculation, but if you do it, you can get really good results. Um, again, you could do flat shading of triangles, Garot shading of triangles where you're interpolating light, lighting contributions between vertices. 
in textured polygons. You can do bit blit operations. Um, you can also do anti-aliasing by super sampling, the sometimes called brute force anti-aliasing. You just render the image 16 or eight times bigger than it actually has to be and then filter that down at the end. You could do that filtering in the parallel uh, pixel nodes. And uh, you know, just, hey, I got an image on the host. I want you to put it on the screen. You could just have that come down. Um, so the, as I mentioned, there's uh, PicLib, a complete 3D graphics API, RayLib, a, a ray tracing API, so you don't have to write your own ray tracer. You can, in terms of the raw low-level operations, you can focus on things like what's the best way to organize my data so I can tell if rays are intersecting primitives or not. This is often called an acceleration structure, and uh, you can experiment with different acceleration structures. Um, to, to get better ray tracing results uh, for your wh whatever it is you're trying to render. Uh, and you've got the DevTools development environment. Uh, so let's take, we have a little bit of time left. Let's take a look at just really quickly at what uh, some of these APIs look like. So we're gonna skip ahead here. So here's uh, just a little piece of sample code of what using PicLib looks like for 3D primitives. You, it's pretty standard kind of stuff, initialization, configuration of uh, the re rendering effects, and then um, you know, doing some kind of drawing. Um, the ray tracing library, uh, what's kind of interesting about the ray tracing library is they use the, because ray tracing doesn't use Z buffers for hidden surface elimination, it uses ray surface intersections to figure out what's in front. So, they just use the Z-buffer memory as a place to store graphic primitives because they're not going to use it as a Z-buffer. But it's a big chunk of memory that you've got sitting around per node, so it's handy uh, to be using that for something. Um, here's an you know, example of ray trace fractal. And um, what's interesting about this machine is it was uh, three orders of magnitude faster at ray tracing than its peers of the day. And this is in 87. It, it was pretty hot stuff. Here's kind of an example of what the ray tracing library looks like. You do initialization, you set up camera parameters, and define some light sources. It's, it's pretty much like um, the standard you know, C style library for doing graphics. It's just in this case, we're doing ray tracing. Um, the dev tools give you basically all the information you need to write code on the host, understand what's going on, a debugger, a linker, an assembler. You've got a simulator for trying out your code before running it on the real machine. Uh, so compared to modern GPUs, I've been mentioning some of the similarities all along, but um, a modern GPU recognizes that the multiply accumulate, or in, uh, say, in NVIDIA parlance, they call it a fused multiply add. These are at the heart of a lot of the inner loops of graphics computation, so it's, that's the operation that you need to go fast. Um, it also recognizes the inherently parallel nature of graphics applications, and that's why they have that big parallel grid array where all the memory is hanging out. And in the pixel machine, it's multiple instruction, multiple data. In a modern GPU, it's what they call single instruction, multiple threads, um, or multiple instruction, multiple threads depending on the, the, the terminology. Um, you also need a high bandwidth access to local memory in order to keep everything going fast. In the end, the final application that's making all this stuff happen still lives on the host. That's the same today. We don't run everything entirely in the GPU. The game is running on the PC, and the GPU is doing the rendering. And it's also very similar that at its core level, a modern GPU is just a device that accepts a stream of commands, and that's the same as the pixel machine. Um, and what's interesting also is that um, to get really interesting things going on graphics-wise, fixed functional units uh, aren't enough. You need general purpose programmable units to unleash your imagination and find new ways to do interesting things. And you need high level language support. You can't be writing all this stuff in assembler. There's too much uh, code to write for it to be in assembler. You just go insane. 
but for certain inner loops, you want to optimize that, uh, as, that, that inner loop to get it to go as fast as possible, and that's where you want to write a little bit of assembly language, and that is possible today on a modern GPU as well as the Pixel machine. Um, in the collection, I was fortunate enough to get a fully loaded Pixel machine with all the hardware and the host interface card. I just need that Sun driver software, so if somebody has it, I need, I need to talk to that person. Um, and what's really also interesting about this machine as well is because of the scalable nature of the hardware, um, if you need it to go faster, you just plug more boards in. And I was told that once uh, somebody from AT&T was going to a trade show to demonstrate this machine, and as they were unloading it off the truck, it like fell off the back of the dock and like a bunch of the cards got smashed. They just took the cards out that were smashed and then it worked. It still worked. It just didn't have as much frame buffer and it didn't have as much performance. So it's, an, it's a nice robust architecture and that it's very scalable that way. Uh, and with that, uh, we can, maybe we have time for some questions. We have time for about two questions There's or so. One over there. How much did this cost in 87, the system you're, you just described? So uh, around this time, I was working at Evans and Sutherland, and we had a graphics machine, a graphics workstation that used AT&T DSP32C chips as well. We had up to 44 nodes in our machine. A 44 node machine would have cost like 150 grand. So I'm guessing like the AT&T Pixel machine fully decked out is probably like around 200 grand, 250. Not cheap, but buy the one with less boards, and when you get more money later, plug more boards in. Any other questions? Okay, thank you.